So our first Bible reading today from God's Word is from the start of the very last book in the Bible, the book of Revelation, so-called because it is a revealing, it's a, a making plain, something that is hugely important, something that we need to hear, an uncovering of something God wants to communicate to His people, the church. And so let's read from Revelation chapter 1 from verse 1 through to 8. And boys and girls, as I read this, you might like to count how many different names are given to God in these brief eight verses. Revelation chapter 1, verse 1. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants what must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant John, who testifies to everything he saw, that is, the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. Blessed are those who read the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear it and take it to heart what is written in it, because the time is near. John, to the seven churches in the province of Asia, grace and peace to you, from him who is, and who was, and who is to come, and from the seven spirits before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, the ruler of the kings of the earth. To him who loves us and freed us from our sins by his blood, and has made us to be a kingdom and priests to serve his God and Father. To him be glory and power forever and ever. Amen. Look, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. And all the peoples of the earth will mourn because of him. So shall it be. Amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was, and who is to come, the Almighty. Amen. Now, can I invite Stephen to come down and join me at the front? Uh, Stephen Kerr. Stephen, it's lovely to see you. We have heard about you. We've been looking forward to meeting you, and I guess you, us, because this is the first time you've been here in Bloomfield Church. Yep. So, uh, Stephen, uh, do tell us a little bit about yourself. Great. <laughs> I always hate that question. Uh, it's like, what, what, what can I tell you from 33 years of, uh, <laughs> of existence? Well, I'm 33. That's a good way to start. Um, my name is Stephen. I'm married to, to Kat, who's over uh, against the wall there. Um, I come from Lisburn, live in Lisburn. Um, and... Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm currently at Union, training um, to be a minister, uh, just starting my third year there, um, so doing a, doing a master's there alongside all the other bits and bobs that they, they, that they ask you to do to, to prepare um, for ministry as well, um, and starting here. Um, I, if, I'm, if, I'm not, uh, if I'm not working for, uh, for Union or uh, around here, um, you'll, you'll probably find me somewhere on a paddleboard um, or in the mountains or doing something um, outside. Um, and yeah, I think that's anything else you want to know at this stage? Or <laughs> Oh, it, there would be plenty of opportunity for that. But, but Stephen, have you always been interested in ministry? Um, no. Uh, <laughs> I think a, a minister once told me that if you really, really want to be a minister, you probably shouldn't be. Um, I don't know what they were, they were getting at by that, but um, no, I, when I grew up, originally um, I, I wanted to be a, an archaeologist. Um, that was mostly because I'd watched Indiana Jones, and I think, like, it, it, it stayed with me until the point where I was applying for, for university, and, and I did put one of my options down as doing archaeology in Queens, and got in, and almost thought about it, um, but no, I, I, I trained as a, as a teacher. Um, I was for a, a short while uh, uh, an RE teacher, um, as well as teaching a, a number of other things in a few schools um, here and there. And um, once I, I graduated from, from Strand, um, 
I, I struggled. I was subbing and, and doing stuff for about a year. And in that time, a, a job came up uh, for uh, being a, a youth worker in a church in Lisbon. And um, a few people had sent it to me and said, you know, I think you should go for this. And, and so I went for that. I got it. And I was the youth worker in Railway Street uh, Presbyterian in Lisbon for, for three years. Um, during that time, I kept getting pulled into more and more and wider ministry contexts and doing different things, preaching and, and, and teaching and that sort of thing. And that was sort of growing in me. But then I, I left that role and went back into teaching for a few years. And, and as I was doing that, I was feeling this sense of, of God just pushing me and pushing me towards, towards ministry. Um, and that led me to then, um, after my time in a school had come to an end, um, to looking around for other things to do and a, an opportunity came up in, in Kirkpatrick up the road as their ministry intern and I again a, a few people had mentioned to me you know think you should maybe go for this this, this looks good went for that got that um, and was there for two years and it was really then that I was really testing out whether God was maybe pushing me or calling me um, into ministry and, and it was during that time then that I applied uh, to Union. Stephen you had been assigned to us as a student assistant what does that actually mean? In other words, how much will we see of you this year and how will that change? You're asking me that question as if I know the answer. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, a student assistant means that I'm, I'm still in, mostly in, in college, um, doing the third year there. So I've a couple of master's units to finish, I have a dissertation to do, um, and then a few different bits and bobs, a few different little courses to do as well, just to, to, to fill all the requirements um, from, from church house. So. Uh, we'll be mostly doing that, but in that time, I've, I've been assigned here to start to get to know you um, and hopefully for you to get to know me. And then um, at the end of this year, there'll be two full years of assistantship with you. So hopefully over this year, I'll get to spend a bit of time with you, um, getting to know you. And, and I don't know really yet how much time. Um, that's all still to sort of be figured out, I think. But um, yeah, just... Well, we'll be able to enjoy you preaching at least once a month, alternately morning and evening and that starts tonight. Yep. Uh, Stephen, uh, there's just a wee gift, and uh, there's also a leaflet called We Are Open, and it has your name on the back. Right. <laughs> so you're definitely here. Um, but finally, how can we best pray for you and Kat? Um, yeah, I suppose just this year is a, is a strange one, um, because although I'm still in college, and that's important, and um, I need to have a focus there, I'm also... Um, I've, got, I've got one foot there and one foot here, and just trying to get the balance of that right, that I'm, I'm, I'm present in, in both places, that I'm getting stuck in and involved um, here as well. So just pray for me as I try and find the, the balance there and the balance between doing both of those things and also um, spending time with, with Kat as well. Kat's a teacher. Um, she's a head of department and pioneering new uh, things this year as well there so she's she's busy um and so just trying to find time for us as well in, in the midst of all that so if you could pray for that pray for me as i as I'm, I'm completing the the masters um lots of lots of reading lots of study um lots of busyness involved in that as well so just keep keep us in our in your prayers for that as well and and, and as we get to know people even in the midst still of 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 this difficult time and having to keep a bit of a distance from people um just just pray for us and all of that um and yeah, I think that's... Well, we'll do that just now. It's interesting, isn't it, that a couple of years ago, we sent Philip to a place called Lega Curry, and now Lega Curry has sent you to us in return. So. You've, you've definitely got the worst end of that deal, I'm afraid, <laughs> but... Let's pray together. Gracious Lord, thank you for your goodness to us, and we look forward to getting to know Stephen and Kat more, and pray that they will quickly feel at home among us and will sense your presence uh, and your leadership and your guidance. Thank you for bringing them to this moment in their lives. And will you continue to bless them and make them a blessing, both at work and in college and in uh, family life and all the other responsibilities that must be jug juggled. So our gracious Father, we look to you and, want, and seek your blessing, not because we are worthy, but because you are kind and our prayers are made in Jesus' name. Amen. Stephen, you're going to read to us from the Scriptures. If you have a Bible, um, we're going to be reading from Hebrews chapter 10. Uh, we're going to be reading verses 19 to 25. 
This is Hebrews chapter 10, verses 19 to 25. These are God's words. Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way opened for us through the curtain that is his body, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and with the full assurance that faith brings, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold on swervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how we may spare one another on towards love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. Amen. On Wednesday evening at our AGM, uh, Jeff, Jeff Gordon, introduced to us a new book called Love Your Church, Eight Great Things About Being a Church Member by Tony Merida. This is going to form the basis of our midweek connect groups this term, as well as our Sunday morning themes. Love your church. Why should we love our church? And the answer to that question may not be exactly what we anticipate. In fact, it could be very different indeed. So let's pray. Father God, you are far more keen to communicate with us than we are often prepared to hear. Will you speak to us then, we pray, so that not only will we hear but also take your word to heart for Jesus' glory. Amen. These past 18 months have changed us. They have changed the National Health Service. They have altered the way we do school, recreation, work. And whether we care to remember or prefer to forget, this past year and a half has affected us we're not the same as we were before. And if that is true in everyday life, it is also true in church. Time out has either increased our longing for reconnection with God and fellow believers, or else given us a convenient excuse to opt out and wander elsewhere, leaving collective worship and fellowship behind. This then is a useful moment for us to stop, to think, and ask why should we love our church? And so today, may I invite you to turn with me then to the Bible passage which we read earlier on from the last book of the Bible, Revelation chapter five, chapter 1. And here in these opening verses of this uh, letter, we see contained a revelation from God, Father, Son, and Spirit, to the seven churches located in the province of Asia. Maybe we should just read the passage again, Revelation chapter 1, verse 1. And it is the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants what must soon take place. He made this revelation known by sending his angel to his servant John, who testifies to everything he saw. That is the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. Blessed are those who read the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear it and take to heart what is written in it, because the time is near. John, to the seven churches in the province of Asia, grace and peace to you from him who is and who was and who is to come, and from the sevenfold spirit before the throne, and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead and the ruler of the kings of the earth, to him who loves us and freed us from our sins by his blood, 
and has made us into a kingdom and priests to serve his God and Father. To him be the glory and power forever and ever. Amen. Look, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. And all the peoples of this earth will mourn because of him. So shall it be. Amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord Almighty, who is, who was, and is to come, the Almighty. Now, here isn't the time to explain the symbolism of the book of Revelation, except to say that although the seven churches referred to here and further highlighted in chapters 2 and 3, which are Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea, we can take it that this is a communication from God to the church universal. In other words, to the whole people of God, in all places, at all times. So this brings me then to my first major point. Why should we love our church? Because God loves His church, and it is through His church that God has chosen to communicate to His people. Now, is that not simply revelatory? Why should we love our church? Because it's a nice place to meet with nice people, because it's a great context within which we can nurture our children, because it is a rock of stability in an otherwise chaotic world. Well, of course. But first and foremost, we are urged to love the church because the church is God's idea and it is His primary means through which God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit communicates to those, verse 5, who have been loved and freed from our sins by Christ's blood. Now, let that idea sink in, if we may. Church is not just some organization or society like the rugby or golf club, where we may meet and play and socialize with other people. Church is not merely another leisure plex where we are able to entertain our children. Church is God's creation, God's design for those who have entered into a saving relationship with Him through Christ Jesus, so that He may continue to communicate with us by the power of the Holy Spirit. In other words, it is a divine creation, not a human concept. It's all about Him, less about us. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave, verse 1, in order to show His servants what must take place. So if the church is God's idea, and if the church is the means through which God chooses to communicate to His people, I want to be part of that. Two, why should we love our church? Because it is through the church that God's people can enjoy a glimpse of heaven through fellowship one with the other. What do I mean? Well, in Revelation chapter 1, God the Father, verse 1, and God the Son, verse 5, and God the sevenfold, that is, the Holy, the perfect Spirit, verse 4, God is communicating from heaven to real people who live in real places at a particular moment in time. We don't have the opportunity right now to explore the specific congregations mentioned in chapters 2 and 3. Maybe we can do that some other time. Suffice to say that they are composed of diverse people from different backgrounds, various places, assorted ages, who nonetheless are united in worshiping the same living Lord. Now, what was it that brought them together? Their socioeconomic background? No. The political party they supported? I don't think so. Their racial and ethnic circumstances? Absolutely not. 
The thing that brought these people together was a common love for the Lord Jesus. Were they perfect? By no means. But the churches to which God communicated were people God had brought together like little embassies of the greater kingdom of God, many consulates designed to represent him in the world. And these people called church were enabled to experience a glimpse of what heavenly fellowship is like so that we in turn may be able to radiate Christ's rule to the world. Even as God himself has eternally enjoyed union and communion among Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, so we are invited to share in fellowship together in community. Think about this. If God were purely single, if God were solo, we should not be surprised if he were to speak only to individual people. We could live then as isolated, individualistic believers. But no, because God himself, three in one, is community. We ought not then to be surprised when he speaks to us as a collective group of people who together, filled with the Holy Spirit of God, interact with each other and love and fellowship among one another. And that is why it is virtually impossible for any of us to live separate individualistic Christian lives. An isolated Christian is an oxymoron. Christians, by definition, belong one to another. We need each other. We need to be part of the whole people of God. Why then should we love our church? Because as God lives and as God loves and moves in perfect union and communion within the Godhead, so he also grants us, the people within whom his Holy Spirit is given. He grants us a glimpse of what fellowship with him can be like for all of eternity. Now, is your head slightly reeling? I'm conscious we're being stretched this morning in our theological thinking, but no harm. Church is far more than something people can merely take or leave according to our whim or notion. It is God's concept. It is God's idea. And if that is the case, we are obliged to sit up and take note because church is something into which we are inordinately privileged, permitted to participate and share in. And so thirdly and lastly, why should we love our church? We'll look at the very practical and particular responsibilities God has given to those who are collectively benefiting from the life and the death and resurrection of Christ Jesus. To him who loves us, verse 5, to him who has freed us from our sins by his blood and made us to be a kingdom and priests to serve his God and Father, we are, verse 7, to proclaim this most urgent and powerful message. Jesus is coming with the clouds. Every eye shall see him, even those who pierced him, and all peoples of the earth will mourn because of him. As people who have been granted life and forgiveness, as part of the church of Christ Jesus, we have been entrusted with this awesome responsibility to proclaim to the world that this Jesus who we nail to a cross, is now the ruler of the kings of this earth, verse 5. And one day every eye, verse 7, and every tongue will confess that he is Lord. We have this awesome message to proclaim that Jesus is Lord. And we can't do it on our own. But as part of the people of God, together, collectively, we can witness to this world that here and now is not all that there is. 
There's a kingdom and there's a reality that is far more real than the one we can presently touch or feel or understand. God has revealed this to us through His Word. He has made this known to His church, His people, things that otherwise would be incomprehensible to those who do not understand. Why then should we love our church? Because God has collectively entrusted to us a message to proclaim that has eternal significance. We started off this morning by asking the question, why should we love our church? Maybe the answer hasn't been exactly what we expected to hear. It's far, far better. We ought to love our church because it is God's idea. It is the means through which God Himself has chosen to communicate to His people. We ought to love our church because it is here that we can glimpse a little insight into what heaven is like through the fellowship of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, what He graciously extends to His people. And we ought to love our church because God has given us a life-enhancing message to proclaim to this lost and searching world that Christ loves us, that Christ has given His lifeblood to rescue us, and Christ is coming soon in order to redeem us so shall it be. Amen. And so collectively shall we unite our hearts in order to pray, in order to say to God be the glory and the power forever and ever. Father God, what a joy What a relief, not to be thrown back upon ourselves, but to have our minds stretched and enlarged and made bigger as we're given a glimpse of the greatness of you and your nature, the graciousness of your revelation through Jesus Christ, your Son. And as we receive this invitation to participate in your great design, the church over which Christ is King, we praise you for this revelation from which we have benefited this morning. And as your kings and priests in this world, enable us as your people collectively to rule well and to intercede faithfully, and to exercise a prophetic voice to this world in its complexity and need. Father God, as part of your church universal, we bring to you our own needs and the needs of our world. These past 18 months have been a trial Some of us have experienced grievous loss and pain. Others are still going through the trauma of separation, issues little known or understood by others. And so to you, O Lord, we turn and seek your grace and peace. We bring to you the needs and anxieties of our loved ones and families, those who love you, others who show no care or concern for you at all. As the one who reveals truth, gracious Lord, may you draw near to all such and do a work of grace in their lives, softening hard hearts, 
dismantling heavy burdens, doing what we could never do, opening blind eyes to see the spiritual realities of life. And so grant us an eternal dimension that makes all the difference to the way we live here and now. Father God, we bring to you the needs and concerns of this world at home, within this nation, in many places overseas. And in the quietness, we pray for those who are experiencing homelessness within our community. And pray for all attempts to provide practical care for families and vulnerable children. We pray for the government, that they may seek to rule with fairness and equity and balance current demands with future expectations. For this world in all its divisions, sufferings and plight, particularly today in Afghanistan, North Korea, and the Lebanon, O oh Lord, we bring to you, our Heavenly Father, the events that we look forward to, the events that we dread, the events we know nothing about this coming week. We pray for Bert and his family for Thursday morning. We pray for Christine and Richard as they anticipate their marriage on Friday. For the events that are in our calendar and those that we know nothing about. Father God, in your wisdom, you have not remained hidden nor far away, but have revealed yourself in the person of your Son, the Lord Jesus. And by the power of his and your Holy Spirit, be pleased to use your church to be instruments of love and care and warning and hope locally, nationally, and internationally. So may we consider how we may spur one another towards love and good deeds not giving up a meeting together as some are in the habit of doing. But may we engage and encourage with one another and all the more as we say the, see the day approaching. In all our ways, enable us to trust in you the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the one who is and who was and is to come, the Almighty. And so to your name be all honor and glory, might and praise, both now and forever.